Well, good morning. Welcome back from Thanksgiving. How'd it go? Did you eat a lot? Pumpkin pie? Apple pie? Pumpkin pie? Apple pie? <laughs> Turkey? Ham? Ooh. Wow, okay. Well, welcome back. Turn to somebody and wave at them and say, welcome back, good to see you. <laughs> so I have just a couple of announcements for us. Uh, number one, next Monday is our last chapel of the semester, unbelievable. Christmas chapel, for those of you that have not been to our Christmas chapel, which will be next Monday, uh, it'll be great fun and so uh, we look forward to uh, seeing you back in the arena next week at 11 o'clock. A celebration of life service, which we'll tell you more about next Monday, will be Tuesday night, December the 6th, so a week from tomorrow night. Um, no, well, one more announcement before I forget. Tomorrow night, we have a big basketball game here in the arena against Alcorn State. So we would love to see you here for that. Uh, we're embarking on uh, conference play here in just a few weeks, and so we're kind of finishing up preseason stuff. So Alcorn State tomorrow night. Wednesday night, the ladies play Arizona State. So we need to show great support to uh, those programs, so we'd love to see you here those two nights uh, this week. Our speaker today is Noemi Chavez. So Noemi, wave at us if you would. So this is Noemi's uh, third time at GCU, and so uh, when she gets to the stage, please give her a GCU warm welcome when she makes her way to speak to us today. Our scripture is from Psalm 30, verses one through five, and it says this. I will exalt you, Lord, for you lifted me out of the depths and did not let my enemies gloat over me. Lord my God, I called to you for help and you healed me. You, Lord, brought me up from the realm of the dead. You spared me from going down to the pit. Sing the praises of the Lord. You, his faithful people, praise his holy name. For his anger lasts only a moment, but his favor lasts a lifetime. Weeping may stay for the night, but rejoicing comes in the morning. Amen? Let's sing.
is where I lay it down. Every burden, every crown. This is my surrender. This is my surrender. Here is where I lay it down. Every lie and every doubt. This is my surrender. Where I lay it down, you 
This is my surrender. This is my surrender. Here is where I lay it down. You are all I'm chasing now. This is my surrender. This is my surrender. Jesus, this morning we've come here prepared. Prepared to receive your presence, prepared to receive your word. Jesus, we thank you for these moments we get to spend together as a student body and with our teachers, with the faculty, Jesus, we thank you for these moments we get to worship you. We get to adore you, we get to glorify you, Jesus. We thank you. Let our prayer for the message, Lord, that we would open our hearts, our ears and our minds to what you have to say to us today. Jesus, we love you and we praise you and it's in your name we pray, amen. Good morning, family. So good to be with you today. Um, man, I was utterly moved to my core in this moment of worship. And I'm just so blown away by how present you all are in this space. Can, can you all just like give yourselves like a round of applause or like a good shout of like, yes, we're here. We're fully present. We're not wasting our time here. We're, there, there's a reason why we have come together and I was blessed, I was encouraged, my heart felt like it wanted to burst out of my chest because of your full engagement in this time of worship. I mean, what are we if we are not created to acknowledge the presence of our God and to worship him fully and freely? And so I'm excited to share with you all in the word today, and we're going to go together to the book of James chapter 2. And today I'm going to be talking to you all about faith. Um, because we all need faith to grow in us. We all need faith to depend on God. We all need faith to grow and to deepen our devotion and our following of Jesus. And I love what James, how he describes faith to us, which I think will be a, a beautiful um, just foundation for how we can continuously commit to this faith. And so let's go to James chapter 2, verses 18 to 26. It says, but someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one, you do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. Do you want to be shown, you foolish person, that faith apart from works is useless? Well, was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? You see that faith was active along with his works, and faith was completed by his works. And the scripture was fulfilled that says Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteous, and he was called a friend of God. You see that a person is justified by works, not just by faith alone. And in the same way, was not also Rahab the prostitute justified by works when she received messengers and sent them out by, the other, by another way? For as the body, apart from the spirit, is dead, so also faith apart from works is dead. James brings to us like this massive challenge when it comes to faith. See, in James, the word faith is not this word that is light, feathery, easy thing. Uh, the word faith is, is much like the word love. It, it's an abstract word. You, you can't be like, oh, I just purchased some faith and here it is. Or I brought some faith in my backpack. Or I carry faith in my pocket. Faith is something that is expressed. It is lived. And the outcome of faith is evident in people's lives, and just like the outcome of love is evident by how you treat someone, how you care for them, and how you spend time with them, much like love, faith requires action. Now, salvation is a gift of love, but what James is inviting us to see is that in order for people or the world to see that there is faith in us, it needs to be accompanied by action. Now, the kind of action that James invites us to is not easy. 
Because faith in action and works is not simply doing nice things. See, the works that James is talking to us about is not like, hey, the world will know you're a Christian if you give the homeless person five bucks. Do acts of kindness. Random acts of kindness do not give us the category name of, Christi of Christians because random acts of kindness are done by people who don't even know Jesus. Right? There's people who don't know Jesus who volunteer at homeless shelters, friends. There's people who don't know Jesus who give a lot of money to the poor. There's people who don't know Jesus who do a lot of things to help others' lives better. Now, I'm not telling you you shouldn't do those things. You should absolutely engage the lives and the hurting world that we are in um, through your faith and through your actions in that way. But James is not talking to us about that kind of faith. I mean, James gives us the example of Abraham who is willing to sacrifice his own son in obedience to God. He's willing to sacrifice whom he loves most. Because the book of Hebrews tells us that Abraham believed I could sacrifice my son and he could actually come back to life if God chooses to do so. Like his trust and his devotion to God was so deep that there was nothing God could ask of Abraham that, that he would not be willing to do even if it cost him what he loved most. And because Abraham believed God in such a way, the Bible says, that he was called a friend of God. The faith that James invites us to is not an easy faith. It is not a faith of good behavior. It's not a faith of just being a good Christian who knows how to behave and knows how to do nice things for others. Doing nice things for others is not enough when we are choosing to follow a Savior whose love for you and for me would take him straight to a cross where he would bleed and die in order to be in relationship with us. I mean, he was really willing to do the hard thing for you and I to come into relationship with our Savior. How beautiful is this God? Now here's what's really cool about this scripture in James. I love the fact that James is not like, hey, I have a great example for you all. You all need to have faith like Abraham, who we now call the father of faith. He is the prime example of what you need to model after. He says, let me give you two examples. I'm going to give you the example of the father of the faith. But I'm also going to give you the example of Rahab the prostitute. Isn't it so good that at the cross, the ground is level, my friends? Isn't it amazing that God is not saying, let me look for somebody whose life is pristinely perfect to give you an example of faith. I'm going to give you the example of a woman who's a prostitute. And she is your example to follow of somebody who has such deep faith that they are willing to do hard things. Man, our faith requires hard things. And those hard things look different for all of us. See, the kind of faith that we're invited to in this journey, since it's not simply a faith of good behavior and being nice to others, because anybody can do that, we are invited to do things that internally feel like they can break our hearts at times. We're invited to do things such as forgive somebody who we feel doesn't deserve our forgiveness. We are invited to do the hard thing of staying faithful to Jesus when everything around you is trying to pull you away from relationship with your creator. We are invited to do the hard things of loving God and loving people who are not lovable. <laughs> now, that is real evidence of God's work in us. I'll tell you what real evidence of God looks like in my life. Growing up, I grew up in a home where my mom is a devout Christian, but my father is a struggling alcoholic. And with that came a lot of really hard memories. I don't know how many of you went back home for Thanksgiving, how many of you are going to go back home for Christmas, and maybe you're getting ready to face some hard situations, some uncom uncomfortable spaces. And so maybe for you, the evidence of your faith is that you would go into that space confident of who God is building you to be, confident in who God is shaping you internally and confident that God has called you to love others despite the brokenness and the pain that the culture or the family you may come from offers. Does anybody know what it's like to be in an uncomfortable situation externally 
and know that God is at work in you. The faith that we are called to is a faith that says, I'm willing to deny myself. And the reason we can actually live this kind of faith is because the Savior that we follow is not a Savior that's just a good Savior that is good at talking things. He's a Savior that is worth following because as we follow him, we follow him to a cross, but we also follow him to, to a third day resurrection. See, he is worthy of our trust. He is worthy of our trust. He is worthy of us actually like we were singing He's worthy of us making room for him. Making room for him in such a way where he can ask things of us that we never would have imagined saying yes to, but now trusting that his plan is better than ours. I love the story of this young man in the scripture in Mark chapter 17, uh, Mark chapter 10, 17 to 22. The Bible says that this young rich ruler comes before Jesus. And he comes to Jesus, and he gets on his knees, and he calls Jesus good teacher. And Jesus is like, why are you calling me good? Because Jesus already knew that. His internal posture was, was not necessarily reverent towards Jesus. He was just doing something that would make him look good in front of Jesus. And he says, what can I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus says to him, hey, you know what you can do is, is follow the Ten Commandments. Like, you know, don't kill people, <laughs> don't cheat on your spouse, don't steal, don't make up lies about others. And this young man was like, I've done all these things. Like he's like patting himself on the back. He's like fully present, check that off the box, I'm good. But I want us to look at what happens in this conversation. Mark chapter 10, um, verse 20 says, and he said to him, teacher, I have kept all these things from my youth. Looking at him, Jesus loved him and said to him, One thing you lack, go and sell all you possess and give it to the poor, and you will have a treasure in heaven and come and follow me. But he was deep, deeply dismayed by these words, and he went away grieving, for he was one who owned much property, much possessions, other versions say. Now, here's what's interesting about this young man is that he came to Jesus with the resume of everything that he felt he needed to do which would give him credit before Jesus. Now remember what I said earlier that good deeds are not just done by Christian people. I mean, the Ten Commandments, don't kill people, don't lie about them, don't cheat on people, you know, don't steal things, don't take stuff that doesn't belong to you. Are these not things that even unbelievers say are good rules, right? Even people who don't know Jesus are like, yeah, you probably shouldn't kill people. It's not a good thing. You probably shouldn't make up lies about your neighbor. You probably should not be, you know, um, hurting others or taking from them. This is just like common knowledge. Like the Ten Commandments give us some really good rules for all humanity to live by. And, and this young man thought, I've done more than enough. Like I'm good. Like I have answered to the invitation that God has given me. But then Jesus says to him, Sell everything you've got and give it to the poor. Man, that, that's, that's a hard request right there. You know, for years I read that scripture and I thought, like, dang, Jesus, like, that's kind of harsh. Like, why wouldn't you just say, hey, man, just leave your stuff, you know, just leave it there. Come and follow me. Like, why would you ask this guy to sell all his stuff and give his money to the poor, like, like, why do you got to be so extreme, Jesus? Like, why do you have to, that's a bit much. That's a lot to ask a person. And there have been times when I would read the scripture and I felt it was a little unfair. Like, Jesus, could we have gone about this a different way? Here's what's amazing about God. Is that the Bible says that as this young man basically rejects the invitation, that Bible says that Jesus loved him as he saw his own physical response. Here's what I want us to understand today, is that in every season of our life, as we're walking with Jesus, he will invite us to do hard things that will be an evidence to him and to ourselves that our life is one of faith. It is a life that fully trusts God. Here's what I'll tell you about my generation, about the people who are in my age group, which are in their 40s and older, 
There's so many Christians in our present world and even in our nation who have a resume of serving Jesus for a season of their life, and they think that they've gotten to the place where they've done enough. Like they're like, I paid my dues. I served Jesus, and I went on two mission trips when I was in college. Like they feel like they knocked this whole service and faith thing out of the box. We're good. I don't have to do one more thing. And you know what has happened? Is that God continues to invite my generation and your generation time and time again to follow him more deeply. Here's the problem. Is that much like this young man, we have looked at Jesus' invitation as less than. Did you hear what I just said? We have thought, you know, Jesus, your invitation is just not enough for me to want to abandon everything I have and everything I know to simply follow you. But if you think about this invitation, Jesus was inviting this young man to be his disciple. He was inviting him to come on a journey where he would have like literally front row seat view of the work of the living God walking on this earth, doing miracles, raising the dead, multiplying food, walking on waters. He was going to have the opportunity of a lifetime, but it was not enough because his resume was more important and his stuff was more important. And the things that he felt good about were far more important than following Jesus. You will encounter the invitation from God over and over again to follow him deeply, to follow him thoroughly, to go farther than you've gone and know and trust that the story only gets better, friends. You know, for me, I was, I was a high school teacher with Los Angeles Unified School District for almost nine years. I was an English teacher in high school. Can you imagine that? High school teacher. And God invites me to start a church, not to take on a church that offered me like a pension plan and retirement and benefits for my family and, you know what I'm saying, a stable salary. No, no, no. God invited me and said, Noemi, I know you have a resume. I know you've built things and you feel really proud of what you've accomplished. But he said to me, are you willing to follow me even if it costs you something? And it was a decision that I made to walk away from being a teacher to being a church planter. Going from a teacher salary to a volunteer salary, which is zero. It was probably after salvation the best decision I ever made in my life. And I'm not sitting here, I'm not standing here trying to make you nervous saying God's going to ask you to give up your career because your career may very well be the place that God is assigning you to impact and be an agent of change in your community and in the world that he is preparing you for. But here is, here's the reality is that God will invite you to exercise faith. And faith is not good behavior. Faith is a will that is bowed down to God. A faith is a will that says, your plan is actually better than mine. What you have to offer is better than anything I can create for myself, God. What you have in mind for me matters more than what I have accomplished this far. You begin to let God tell the story of your life. You become a participant in the miracles that he will do in the lives of others, no matter where you end up. Trusting that he is worthy of our following. And too many times we become complacent with what we can build. And guess what, friends? When we become complacent with what we can be build, we end up living a life much like this young rich ruler, which the Bible says he left with deep sorrow, with his face downcast. Other scripture says with sadness in him. Why? Because every time that we say no to Jesus, every time we say that's that's not what I planned to do. I just wanted you to be proud of what I've done this far. We end up seeing people who live a sad faith. A sad Christianity. 
Do you know how many Christians I know who are in my age group, who are in their 30s, who are in their 20s, who live a sad faith? Because they've said no to every invitation that required for them to believe that God's invitation was worthy to follow, was worthy to respond to, was worthy to accept. And so as, as you are even in this season, what does hard look like for you? What are the difficult things that God is inviting you to do? What are the challenges that he has placed inside of you? That you feel this tension in your heart and you know that there's an invitation from God saying, will you follow me? Will you ignore the resume of what excitement and life feels like and looks like based on the world that you live in? Or will culture suck you in and say, that's not life. And yet the creator of the heavens and the earth is inviting you to an adventure that will revolutionize how you view yourself and how you view others. And there's nothing more empowering than to know that you are walking with the God who spoke things into existence. You could trust the narrative of your story to him. You will have no regrets in doing so, my friends. You will have no regrets in saying yes to God, yes to Jesus, yes to going into the spaces that don't necessarily look glorious to others, yes to saying I'm going to serve you even when it's not easy, yes to saying, yeah, good things you know, good things, good deeds are popular. Hard things are not. And our faith is not made for us to follow what is easy and comfortable. We are called and we are invited to follow a Savior who is willing to walk through the hard things with us. Can you be encouraged this morning? Can we be encouraged to understand that the resume of our good deeds means nothing if we're not willing to do the hard things. I want to pray for you today. Because so many, rides, so many things ride on the line of our obedience and our response to God. And I don't know what hard thing God is inviting you to. Maybe the hard thing for you is simply to submit your will, your flesh, your desires to his love. To follow him. Maybe the hard thing God is asking you to do is to go into spaces that feel dangerous to you, that feel, that, that feel like, like, like a threat to you. And God is saying, I'm with you. I've got you. I'll protect you. I will lead you. I will show you. I will guide you. Maybe he's calling you to simply be somebody who loves Jesus and walks faithfully with him amongst people who are far from him. Maybe he's inviting you to trust him even when the people you love the most know nothing about him. And he's saying, will you follow me? Will you stay close to me? Or will you say, God, I already went to a bunch of chapels this year. That's about good enough for me. I checked things off my list. I was a pretty decent student. And Jesus is saying, will you go further? I invite you to a journey that could change everything in the course of your life. And so I want to pray for you today so that God would give you not only the courage, but that you would submit your will and bow your will to Christ and say, Lord, your will be done and not my own. Father, I thank you for every student within the sound of my voice. I thank you for your love and your faithfulness to us. God, I thank you that you don't, you don't only invite us one time, but you invite us over and over again. And I thank you, Lord, that you don't give up on us that your work in us continues to grow our faith, deepen our trust in you, and cause, Father God, for there to be a courage in us to love you, faithfully serve you, and follow you, even when it's not easy, even when it's not pleasant, even when others are not looking, even when others don't applaud it, that you are worthy of our follow. We love you, Father. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Que la paz de Dios sea con vosotros, que el rostro del Señor brille sobre cada uno de ustedes y ponga en ti paz. God bless you.